Yeah. We've all got it. Yeah, yeah, that, that, the, the fear of people thinking you're a Im fan. Or imposter syndrome, it's called. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are you actually working on at the moment? Top Secret. All oh, right, you started a... Started yeah, I'm starting the Top Secret thing. It's going to be announced in a few weeks, but I'm not allowed to talk about it just now. Yeah. Um, and just, I've got a, a Christmas short story to write, a ghost story for Christmas for a magazine. Um, so I've got bits and pieces. Yeah. And how's, how's Edinburgh? Is it... Um... I mean, I've not been into the centre of Edinburgh the last few days because I was away up north on holiday. So I don't know. I think the tourists are starting to creep back in. Mm -hmm. um, some of the restaurants and some of the bars have opened. Um, none of the music venues, of course. And there's no festival. Yeah. So there's nothing for them to do. Well, I guess they could just walk. They could be glad that they actually are somewhere and it's a beautiful city to walk about in. Well, it's pissing down today, so Is hopefully it? they're all... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's proper festival weather. At least you don't have the partial lockdown like we've got here. The, uh... Well, it might be coming, you never know. Um, there's been a few little blips in Scotland, a pub oh. in Aberdeen. Oh, so they had like 20 or 30 cases just from the one pub. I've been to a couple of pubs since they reopened and I just don't like it. it it's not relaxing. Well, it's, it's, almost like, it's, it's almost like you're, you're going to a bar during, you know, Nazi occupation. Yeah. You know what I mean? But the virus is the Nazis, yeah. uh, and you're waiting for it to walk in the door and stop all the fun. Is this, is this on the inside of a pub? Or out, I've been outside and outside, uh, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, even outside sitting at a table, you, somebody brushes past you, you think you're too close, mate, you know. Yeah. But I did go inside a pub a couple of times, and, you know, they've got perspex between the tables. It's only table service. You can't stand at the bar. You can't linger at the bar. They've even sometimes got a, you can only sit for an hour or two and then you've got to move on. Really? Yeah. So it's not very relaxing, man. It's not why I go to pubs. So it's not, um, so you, you're not one of those people who thinks, I'll make do with this till it gets better. You, you, you want the proper experience back. Yeah, yeah. It's like live music. Can you imagine going to a gig and you're all 20 feet apart? I've, I've, I've seen a few. Actually, I've been to gigs like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the joke in the DIY scene when they say you, you can only get 80 people in the venue and everyone goes, that many. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't, there's no atmosphere, though. There's no atmosphere when you go to a gig and there's only a dozen people there. And people are edgy because they don't really know if it's safe or not. And, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I kind of think it's better than nothing. We, we, we have to take these steps and then... Maybe then it's 85 people, then it goes back to 70, then we go up to 90. And it's... Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the one thing I've been doing during lockdown is buying as much music as I can from the artists online. And if they've not got music, I'll buy their T-shirts. I got a Spiz Energy T-shirt recently. That was funny. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. he does a lot of T-shirts. He said, he said, do you want it black and white or coloured? I went, I want it coloured. And he coloured it in himself. And he said, I don't know whether this will be fast or not. You know, you might put it in a washing machine. And so he sent, me a, he sent me the felt pens with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I can colour it in again. <laughs> what a brilliant touch. I said, what did you actually um, do the T-shirt? I mean, what, what they should do, he should do, is actually on Zoom, you could watch him design your T-shirt for you. Yeah, colour it in. For, yeah. for another fiver. <laughs> yeah. this is Every little bit helps. This is what we're down to now as musicians, just selling everything apart from the music. Merch, merch. I mean, that's it. That's it. I mean, you, you see it now, don't you? You never used to see bands and artists after the gig coming out and sitting at a table and signing everything. Mm. And now even pretty well established artists will come out and sell, flog their merch at the end because that's how they're making their money. Yeah, we did. When we're doing uh, the Lanigan tour, he was coming out uh, selling his merch at the end and he's... Um, the most introverted person ever. So it's, it's pretty hard work for him. Yeah, Standing yeah, yeah. With, his, with his head down like that, just like, like, it's quite awkward. Have you, read his, have you read his book yet, John? Yeah, he, he gave me on tour. It's... Uh, oh, right. It's, it's pretty it's, hardcore. It is, isn't it? What, what, what redeems it is it's really well written and yeah. he, he batters himself. He, <clears> he really has... He's angry with himself for getting himself into that state. And it's not like... Yeah. Um, Oh, just a rock and roll, sex, drugs and rock and roll book, which is ostensibly is on one level, but it's actually beautifully written, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And, you know, I mean, some of the anecdotes, even if he wasn't a musician or a well-known musician, would still be extraordinary to read. <laughs> the stuff that not quite finding, um, uh, uh, what's his name, Nirvana, um, Kurt Cobain, not quite finding the body when yeah. he went to look for him at his house. Um, 
And the one about the guy who he got close to, who he started ripping off, the guy had money left to him by his family in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And Lanigan and this other guy just were ripping him off, taking his money and stuff. It was extraordinary. Yeah. It's, um, it's, that's, that's what happens when you're, a, when you're a junkie. Yeah. Yeah. But most people don't talk about those bits, but he, he kind of embraces the whole, the whole story, doesn't he? And it's hideousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as you say, even though a lot of it doesn't reflect well on him, no, he, no. You know, he's 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 always after the truth. He's always he's always going to give you the truth. It's 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 not an advert for uh, the junkie lifestyle. That's for it's sure. not an advert <laughs> for the rock and roll lifestyle, man. <laughs> the funny thing about him. Anyway, let's get this thing yeah. done. I've got a TV crew coming to, to talk about. Well, we're not talking about punk, but they're they're making a documentary series about Scotland since devolution, and they want to talk to me about kind of the punk years. Okay. Um, that's, that's so we'll see what happens with that. Maybe the roots of that idea, like an empowerment of people in Scotland. Or... Yeah, I mean, I've talked about it. I think I've talked about it to you, that yeah. notion that you could do anything that went hand in hand with the politics of the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's what we're going to be discussing. But anyway, they need an hour to set up, and then it's going to be a couple of hours filming. So. Yeah, it's difficult now with, it, with all the social distancing. Yeah. yeah, I've had to fill in forms and all kinds of things saying I've not got COVID and not got this and that. Yeah, you I don't get... make my cup of tea. You don't, you, you don't want to get ill, then Scotland gets independent and you miss it. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> so we're going to talk about um, t doing the Times crossword. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it's, as 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 a man of words, is is that like a bit like a busman's holiday in a sense? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've got to put this into context a little bit. I started doing crosswords when I was a kid. Uh, we, we got a newspaper called the Courier, the Dundee Courier, and it had a quick crossword in it, just a general knowledge crossword. Uh, and I would get a, had a little dictionary and I would sit and try and do this and my dad would help. And it became a kind of thing that we'd do it all the time. And then when I arrived at university, I started buying The Guardian. And I hadn't really seen a cryptic crossword before. And here were these extraordinary things written by these extraordinary mad people, all of whom were pseudonymous. You didn't know who any of them were. Um, and, and it was just like a battle of wits. And I really enjoyed the, I enjoyed it. I've always enjoyed wordplay. And when I was at university, one of my favorite authors was a guy called Thomas Pynchon. And Pynchon uses a lot of uh, code and wordplay and puns and all kinds of things in his books. And also, this was a time of deconstruction and semiotics. You were always looking for the codes that were hidden within everyday mm -hmm. transactions. And for me, the, 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 the cryptic crossword became part of that. And at some point, I then moved from the Guardian to the Times, I think because everybody said, oh, the Times is the hardest cryptic. I mean, I started it, John, I was, I was shit. I, I really, you know, I'd get maybe three or four or five. And what I would do is get the next day's paper, look at the answers and work out from the previous day's clues what it should have been and why I didn't get it. And I got better. I got better. And I've continued to this day, and I, I try occasionally try even harder crosswords, the listener crossword, these really, really, really complicated ones where there's not a cat and house chance I am going to know the word, the answer in my head. It'll be some obscure Peruvian botanic thing, a botanical item, you know, uh, or it'll be some something from an obscure civilization. But the wordplay, the clues that you're given allowed you allow you to get have a go at it. And these days with mobile phones and Google, you can have a go at checking, well, is that word, does that word actually exist? And is it an obscure Peruvian medicinal plant? Oh, yes, it is. Right. I'll put that in. Uh, so I do it every day, man. Before I start my, my day's work, I sit down. In fact, I've got today's here. This is today's. How far? Time to oh, yeah. uh, filled yeah. in, man. Oh, come on. I'll, always filled in. Always finished. It, today it took me about 20 minutes, which isn't bad. Sometimes it can take half an hour. Um, today's one was fairly straightforward. I've no idea who compiled it. Um, but a lot of it was, was anagrams, and I'm pretty good at anagrams. So I'll give you a very quick one. So one across, aunt, A-U-N-T, boils muddy washing well straight away i go okay muddy is a clue telling me that it's an anagram of ant boils in other words those letters are mixed up and i can tell that because they're looking for a nine letter answer and ant boils is nine letters so it's a nine letter word meaning washing and it's an anagram of ant boils ablutions mm -hmm. so i've got that one quite quickly once you get one across you're rocking and rolling because then you've got the first letters of some of the down ones. so it didn't take me long today but it was it was uh it was good. It was good fun. It wasn't too complex today. Do, do you have an order? Uh, 
do you start with one across and then just no. go through? Is it? No, it's kind of weird. Often I find myself, I mean, I don't think overthink this, but often I'll go through it and I'll, I won't get one across. I won't get the next one. I won't get the next one. I won't get the next one. Then I'll get one. And then I'll, I'll go, and, I, and I'll, for that one, will give me some letters. So I'll start somewhere down the middle of the crossword. I might get a few. Sometimes I start at the bottom and work my way back up, mm. depending on which clues I've got first. I don't go through a clue at a time. I mean, I do start at one across, um, but very soon I can find myself on three down, 13 across, 21 across. Um, and I do it that way. And as you gather more and more letters, it gets a little bit easier. Um, but it's fun. And one year on my birthday, and I've not actually got it here. I've got it framed somewhere. The Times crossword. I was sitting and doing it in a cafe on my birthday. And one of the answers was Rebus, my oh. detective character. And I'm shit sure they did that on purpose because they knew it was my birthday. Um, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. And, and Rebus has been used a few times in various cryptic crosswords. People send me them. Um, and quick crosswords as well, you know. Um, author of the Rebus novels, 3-6. Mm. People will send me that and say, oh, look, you're in the, whatever, the, the mirror quick crossword today. Tea time crossword. Um, but when you're in a, I've even been in a New York Times. I was, I was in a New York Times crossword, which is a general crossword once, and somebody sent me that. Again, I think it was Ian Blank, author of the Inspector Rebus novel. Um, which I'm sure very few Americans got because I'm not very well known <laughs> over there. That's a difficult crossword. Uh, but I love it. I just love the sense that somebody's having fun with words and it makes me look at words. I look at the words that are hidden inside words because sometimes it will be a phrase or a, a sentence, but hidden within it is the answer, i.e. the letters in order somewhere in that phrase will give you the, the answer you're looking for. There was one in today's, but I'm not, I can't see it off the top of my head. Um, and sometimes it's easy. Okay, I'll give you an easy one, John. Are you, are you any good at crosswords? I hardly ever do. Uh, all right, I'll give you an easy one. Okay, so if you're reading it, it says, nice policeman, N-I-C-E, nice policeman, question mark, eight letters. Uh, good cop. No, is it? No, I can't get it. I'm concentrating. Yeah, yeah. What you've got to do is you've got to say, no, it's not nice, it's nice. Oh, I see. So what would you call it? So gendarme is the yeah, answer. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, yeah. So as soon as you go, well, nice policeman's too simple. That's too too easy. It can't be. It can't be anything to do with a policeman who's nice. Nice. That's a place in France. What do they call a cop in France? A gendarme. So I got that one pretty quickly. Hooray! A matter of understanding the code of the compiler of the crossword. Yeah. You yeah, it does. That. And sometimes, for example, in the Guardian, although they don't give you the real names, they give you the the, the kind of pseudonym of the person who's doing it and you can work out oh that person likes lots of anagrams oh that person likes lots of obscure classical references you know that this person likes wordplay you know um all of that uh helps aricaria is the biggie aricaria in the uh, guardian used to be the most difficult one mm -hmm. and i interviewed him once and i forget his real name but he, he came to the edinburgh book festival because he had a it was either a book about crosswords or he had introduced a book of Guardian crosswords. And so he came up to promote that. And I got to interview him in front of an audience, which was great fun. All these nerds, crossword nerds, because we never get together. It's a solitary pursuit for people who are a bit nerdy and a bit solitary, you know, a bit solipsistic. So we unless you're going for the Times Championship one where people actually sit in a room and try and do it. And my God, that's way beyond me. They'll say things like the, the, win, the winner this year did three crosswords in 90 seconds. And wow. you go, fuck off. <laughs> really? It takes me 20 to 25 minutes on average to do a times crossword. These people are doing three um, in less time and I can do one. So that's the real, that's the, that's the top. But meeting Aricaria was fantastic. And I did say to him, I said, my favourite clue of yours, which was when I was a student, was Hegs, question mark. H apostrophe E-G-G-S, question mark. Hegs. And the answer, it was, it was 11 letters. And the answer was exasperated. Oh, exasperated oh. sounds like eggs aspirated. Eggs with a H, oh. eggs. And he said, no, mate, that's not one of mine. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know who it was. But I'd always, I'd always said to people that was Eric Aria and that. He said, no. When you interview him, does he speak in like codes as well? Yeah, I mean, what he was doing was he had a kind of whiteboard and he was saying to people, look, this is how you would tackle one of my crosswords. Mm -hmm. one of my clues and often if you buy one of the books of of guardian times whatever cryptic crosswords it is at the start will be an introduction that will give you some tips and some advice on how to have a go at solving them um but if i'm stuck i just wait till the next day and i look at the answer and then i go back i'll have kept the previous day's crossword 
go back and look at the clue and go, all oh, right, it's that broken down, or I didn't quite notice that, or they tricked you. I mean, the good ones will trick you into going one direction, thinking it's an anagram, and it isn't. Mm. Or not noticing it's an anagram because you're too busy looking at something else. It's a, I did compile one once. The Herald newspaper in Glasgow asked me to compile a cryptic crossword for them. And it took days for me to do it. It was so complicated. Um, and you do what you tend to do. People think as a crime writer, you have, you, you have the solution before you start writing the, the book. And then you work backwards, put, putting in clues. I don't do that. I sort of work my way towards a solution, not knowing at the start who the killer is or why they did it or how they did it. With a crossword, you really do work like that. You've, you've got a grid, you fill it in with words that fit, and that can be difficult to find words that will fit into the grid. And then you start doing your clues. Um, and it's just, it took me a long time, and I had a new respect for these people who are sometimes doing half a dozen of these a week for different magazines and newspapers online. People subscribe to online sites, I don't, where you can get a crossword a day. Some of the people who do crosswords, cryptics, also do quizzes. Um, you know, three questions, five questions, they'll do the Sudokus, they'll do this, they'll do that. They're just puzzle fanatics. Mm -hmm. um, there's one guy who works in a bookshop up in uh, Inverness who I've known for donkey's years, works in the Waterstones there, John Featonby. And he used to do lots of different types of puzzles. Uh, and he would just, he, he thought it was great fun to compile these things. Doing a crossword, I, I thought, no, I'm not giving up the day job to become a crossword <laughs> compiler. I'm happy to solve them over a cup of coffee. I was less happy to have to do the hard work. Yeah, it's a very, very different kind of discipline then to actually compile the crossword than to fill it in. It is, it is. And, but you do find that people who are into crime fiction often are also into Sudoku, crosswords, cryptics, quick crosswords, general knowledge. Uh, my son, who doesn't read crime fiction, has started getting into general knowledge crosswords. He's not quite got into cryptics yet, but he does the uh, general knowledge ones and the kind of quick ones, as they're called, mm -hmm. where you're just looking for a synonym for a word. Um, I, I do those occasionally, but I just, it's the, it's the, can you, it, it takes me back to that first love of language I had, you know, sitting as a kid with a quick crossword and a little dictionary, flicking through the dictionary to see if you can find the word you're looking for, found me lots of words I didn't know the meanings for, mm -hmm. and that increases your vocabulary, um, and that helps you as a writer, and it's part of that, I'm still kind of drawn to words for their beauty and for the kind of secret structure that's hidden within them. Um, and again, that takes me back to being a student and studying semiotics and deconstruction, all that stuff we used to love as students. People say, bloody waste of time. Um, <laughs> but I used, to, I used to lose myself in those Pynchon novels, Thomas Pynchon novels, where he's looking for a secret code or a secret organization and he has to find the clues to that. And I think a lot of that drip fed into my crime fiction when I started crime fiction. Because I came to crime fiction as a lover of puzzles, not as a lover of crime fiction necessarily. And so the word rebus, the name Rebus is a puzzle. It's a picture puzzle. Um, and in the first couple of Rebus novels, uh, lots of puzzles, lots of clues are to do with typography or words or words hidden within sentences. And that's just me playing with words, playing with language. So, so in a sense, uh, a Rebus novel is like a giant crossword. I guess. I mean, there's clues that are kind of, I'm trying, I'm trying to stop you seeing, but they're there if you're clever enough to see them or sharp enough to see them. Um, there are red herrings that are things that aren't going to lead you anywhere, but you think might. So there's something of the maze in it, but there's also something of the, uh, the puzzle solving. Um, yeah, I mean, there are, I mean, yeah, puzzles, puzzles. They are intrinsically puzzles, I guess. I guess they are intrinsically puzzles. But there's something about, I mean, it probably sounds like a really boring thing. You know, I say people, people say, oh, you, you know, what's your hobby? And you go, well, something that involves words. You know, I do it for a living, but also it's what I do for a hobby. And the other thing is I do it with music playing. So often there'll be some, I'll have headphones on or there'll be music playing in my office while I'm doing the crossword. Um, and it's just, a, you know, when I retire, that's how I'm going to spend my days, John. I'm going to spend my days lying on the sofa, listening to music and doing crossword after crossword after crossword. <laughs> The, the way you relate sad, to sad bugger that I am. <laughs> there's there's worse, worse ways to lie in a settee. So, <laughs> the way you listen to music and react to music, is there a correlation to the way you listen to, uh, to the way you do a crossword? Is, is it like a puzzle that you have to unravel or is it completely different? No, it's completely different. I mean, usually if, I mean, it's a bit like writing a book. I've told you this before, but if I'm writing a book, I cannot have, I've got to have music playing, but it cannot be music that's got words. 
no lyrics, because otherwise I'm listening to the lyrics and I'm not writing. Same with a crossword. If there are lyrics, I'm going to be listening to the lyrics and I'm not going to be focused on the crossword. So it tends to be ambient stuff. Um, uh, the poll reissues, um, really good electronic musician I'm listening to just now. Uh, a new band, well, new, new to me band, band musician called Worried About Satan, who's a bit like Pie Corner Audio. Um, Pie Corner Audio, I love a lot. So anything like that, Lords of Canada, electronica is what's usually playing, just to de-stress me. You know, part of doing the crossword is just chilling out before the day's work begins, before the evil hour when you have to sit down and actually start making a crust. Uh, and I, was, I, mean, it's like, it's, I think it's a deferring the, the evil hour, you know, because I can't do anything in the morning until I've had my coffee, read the paper, done the cryptic, and done the Sudoku. And once those are all done, which is about between 10 and 11 a.m., then I can start actually thinking, right, I better do some work now. Like an athlete. Warming up. Warming up, warming up the brain. I mean, they do say that about crosswords. They say that it can ward off dementia. Mm. Um, keeping your brain active, whether it's a Sudoku, a quick crossword or a cryptic crossword, anything that's using your brain regularly is going to ward off dementia. It's going to ward off um, the evil hour. I don't know if that's true for me, man, because in lockdown, I'm losing words. You know, I try and think of the most simple word or the most simple phrase, and I'm struggling to remember it. I think my brain has been vegetating. I can still do a crossword, mm. Um, mm. but I find reading quite difficult in lockdown. I don't find writing difficult, but I find reading quite difficult. I've been reading books that are quite easy to read, not the big classics that I thought I'd be reading. Is not it, War and Peace. Maybe lack of confidence, you know, being in the pub or meeting people in the streets, because we yeah, have to, to talk to you now, aren't there, because of this? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, that thing about, I mean, especially going into a pub, I mean, you know I love pubs, and part of the fun of a pub is wordplay. It's standing at the bar with other people and they're joking, they're punning, they're telling you a joke, they're making jokes up. You say something, they pun on it, you riff back on that. Or you're talking about best gigs you ever saw, best bands you ever saw, where to buy a good steak, where was the last great meal you ate. All this stuff is keeping your brain, you know, the synapses are snapping. Mm -hmm. um, and the Oxford bar where I usually drink, which isn't open and I doubt will reopen anytime soon because it's so small they can't do social distancing. Is that it was just that you had to be sharp. You didn't go in there to relax. You had to be sharp in there. It was like being a boxer entering the ring, but using words instead of fists, mm. you know? And, uh, and there'd be somebody riffing on something. Whenever, as soon as you went in, there'd be some chat that you became part of. And if you wanted to be part of that chat, you had to be sharp. Mm. And um, I do miss that. You're right. I mean, maybe that's part of it. It's just me sitting for long stretches of time. Mm. on my own with the inside of my head for company and not talking to anybody except you so thanks for that thanks for breaking <laughs> yeah. up <in> the <laughs> i mean not only just riffing on, on people when you're talking you know riffing on what they're saying but sometimes when people say a word do you find yourself deconstructing that word and trying to think yeah. is it a latin word you know um second part yeah. of that word sounds a bit like the word the roman word for foot and you kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. you get this weird Always. little portal into another time where the word got made up yeah, I mean, it's even weirder than that. I, I, mean, I, I don't know if I've told anybody this before, but it's a thing I've done since I was a kid, and I think it's an autistic OCD thing. But I'll break up a word in its component parts, and I'll give them a kind of value. So I'll try and balance it. So I don't know, let's try and find one. Redolent, redolent, so redolent. So it's got three vowels. Uh, you know, it's got uh, five words, uh, five letters that aren't vowels. The R would, I'd give, a, I'd give, I'd give the R two, because um, it's, it's like R when you pronounce it, it's just two letters, they are. Uh, D, or redolent, the D would be three, D, E, E. I would give my kidney, and I'll try and break it up into twos and threes and, and all that kind of stuff. Why the fuck am I doing that? <laughs> and, and I'll just jumble the word up and make it so that it actually is, uh, is, is more pleasing, you know? I can't believe that OCD isn't CDO. I mean, it should be in the right order, for God's sake. What are you doing to people with OCD that you don't put it in the right order? Uh, <laughs> Or even ODC, put it backwards or do something that makes it kind of relevant to us. Um, and I've always, I don't know where that comes from. I've just always done it, breaking up words and sentences, breaking up language into its component parts uh, and making a little secret code that only makes sense to me. I, you know, if I say that to you, you're going, what is this guy on? And I, really drugs, like drugs, are, drugs are not involved in this, John, at any stage. <laughs> I do do my own version where I break the words into little bits and try and work out where the word, maybe where the word, word red came from and does it correlate with another word to get the meaning of that word. So it's, it's not as mathematical, but it's, um, 
it's just it's just a fascination and also yeah well if you write lyrics um as as, as you're writing poetry you you've got to be even if it's at a subconscious level there's a structure there's a rhythm to the lines and a structure mm -hmm. and a and a rhyme scheme of course usually um that you're working on and sometimes you're working on it subconsciously so you, the words come to you and it's only later on you realize there's a rhythm there that you weren't aware of an iambic rhythm or whatever it happens to be and I remember that from university studying poetry and just digging deep into um, the, kind of the, the rhythms that poets live with. And as a novelist, I am in, maybe this is, brings us back to crosswords again. I'm incredibly jealous of people who can use words, the perfect word, or use words in a very tight way. I've got hundreds of pages to say what I want to say and to get the theme out of what I, what I think the theme of my story is. A poet has got a few lines. Mm -hmm. A songwriter, a lyricist has only got a few lines to make you feel something, you the listener feel something, react, learn, um, inhabit their head, mm -hmm. um, feel what they're feeling. Um, or they take you into a different consciousness, they take you into a different universe with the words. Um, that's what I loved about Hawkwind, I was an early fan of Hawkwind, was that sense that I could sit in my teenage bedroom or pre-teenage bedroom in a working class village in Fife and be transported to worlds beyond this world. Um, and, you know, crosswords do that. Crosswords are using a minimum of words. The guys, and it's mostly guys, the people who compile these crosswords, they've only got a certain space to give you the clues in. They can't yeah. ramble on for three or four lines in this clue. It's got to be quite tight. You know, that one, it was basically two words, nice policeman, nice policeman, two words, boom, that's what they've got. Um, but within that, they're containing the whole, kind of, the whole puzzle for that, for that one clue. Um, and I love that. I love the fact that they are so um, tight on language. The language is so contained and constrained. And as a novelist, I'm just a loose, baggy creature who's got as many words to, as many words to use, as many lines, as many sentences. A sentence can be any length. A paragraph can be any length. Um, and the computers made that even worse because with computers, you don't, you know, with a typewriter or handwriting. You're not a paper. Man, man, you didn't make a book any longer than it had, it had to be. But now it's so easy to correct stuff and it's so easy to keep going. You just keep going. And crime novels. Crime novels used to be under 200 pages. Almost always under 200 pages. If you go back to the Golden Age, the Agatha Christie's and the Raymond Chandler's. And now they're 500, 600, 700, 800 pages. And it's just because, I don't know, it's partly because it's just so easy to keep going. Yeah, there's no stopping point. That's so, so what do you want? My books are getting shorter. As I'm getting older, my books, blessedly, are getting shorter. I'm always afraid I'm going to die before I finish writing it. Right, so as soon as I get started, I want to write quick. So in a way, what, you, what you're saying here is a crossword is, could be the purest form of poetry that, yeah. you know, a, a book, 800 pages, a uh, song lyric, four verses, <clears throat> crossword, you've got to get the point, the emotion, the clue, everything. Yeah, yeah. In, not even into one word, but a breakdown of a word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that one I gave you, Heggs, H apostrophe E G G S, could be E E Cummings. Mm. Almost. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you could just have that. That could just be a, that's a poem in itself almost. And then at some point the reader goes, what the hell? Oh, it's exasperated. So you it's know. Not, it's, it's, it's not just for your mind to work out what that person means by that. You actually look at that, Heggs, and think, that, 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 that is uh, a work of art to have that. <laughs> it's a work of art, art. which yeah. is why it's stuck in my head for almost 50 years, no, 40, 40 years. That is stuck in my head, that one crossword clue. Not many crossword clues stick in my head, <laughs> but that one was just so great. And I don't know if I even saw the crossword that was in it. I think a mate of mine at uni told me it. I think a mate of mine at uni said, I did this crossword yesterday, and there's an amazing clue in it. And we sat in the pub drinking, and he said, see if you can guess what it is. Pegs. And I went, you know, uh, no, I, I've got no idea. Exasperated. Oh, man. You know, <laughs> and, and then we started discussing it and, you know, how clever that, how clever is that? Yeah, there's, it's, 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 a, it's a hell of a discipline to, to squash everything into about four letters, isn't it? So, and maybe like the music you listen to when you're writing, like minimal electronic music, maybe it's a word version of that, you know, it's... Instead of having the drums, the guitars, the orchestra, it's just a keyboard going between two notes is yeah. some kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's obviously a deep structure to a lot of this stuff that I'm just not getting. I just let it wash over me. I mean, you know, for example, when you listen to music for airports and stuff like that, which I do a lot, um, his, his really ambient stuff. It's just, as you say, it's just a few notes repeated um, with very slight differences and pauses and um, dying notes and things like that. Uh, and I, 
there would there will be, I mean you know what he's like there will be a structure there he will have created a structure for that but for me it's just the atmosphere that's mm -hmm. what I'm really it's, it's, it's the the bubble that that takes me into where it's uh, where the inside of my head can be freed up to come up with its own stuff. Mm. And do, you th do you think the English language lends itself beautifully as well to crosswords? I mean, I'm sure other languages have great crosswords in them, but because it's such a fluid language and you can make up words, you can change it, you can change your meanings, everything all the time. It's not a strict language. Do you think it's almost a perfect language for crosswords? I think, you know what? I think you've, you've hit on something because, I mean, I've lived overseas and I go overseas a lot and I buy a lot of newspapers and magazines when I'm overseas. And you might get a, kind of a general knowledge crossword or a quick crossword. You tend not to get the cryptics. The cryptics tend to be a, 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 an English language form, and it could just be that a language lends itself to them. Um, you know, the New York Times, which is a famous crossword, the American crosswords in general tend to be general knowledge crosswords or crosswords where you're looking for a synonym. There's a word and you're just looking for a synonym for that word. They tend not to go in for the cryptic stuff. Um, and, and it's just in France, I think I remember it being much the same. Uh, they go in for puzzles in France. I mean, the Rebus, the Rebus, is, is, is famously a French puzzle. You can buy books of them in France. It's, it's a series of pictures that are kind of telling you a story or giving you a message with letters added or taken away. Uh, and the French love those, they love these little puzzle books. And Sudoku, of course, being numbers, that's a universal language. So every <laughs> culture you go to, you'll find Sudoku or a, or a variation thereof. But cryptic crosswords tend to be a, a form that's, that's unique to the United Kingdom. That's sad. I really hadn't thought much about that, but it, I think it's true. Yeah, we do like playing with words, don't we? We, we have that strand of surrealism that goes through our... Uh, yeah, and you get it in our comedy. You get that puns. You get a lot of puns and things uh, uh, in comedy that you tend not to get in, in other languages. Um, onwards, and I was just thinking about that the other day because somebody had put up a, on Twitter, somebody put up a little bit from The Naked Gun or the TV series, what was it called, that The Naked Gun was taken from? police squad and it was a kind of it was a um you know he you know so you shot the, you shot you know he, he came into the bank and he shot the teller no i shot the i shot the teller once once was the name of the teller and it was it was that kind of thing and it reminded me of that famous um who's on first no what he's on set he's on second who's on first it's a kind of abbott and costello riff that's an old vaudeville an old music hall thing and my son and i were discussing this we, took, we went from the police squad riff on it to the Abbott and Costello who's on first he's on second thing where it's their surnames the surname is who the surname is he um I actually googled it and we went back to look at where it came from and it came from English American music hall vaudeville it was a skit that people have been doing on stage for well over a century and it keeps being reinvented and it's wordplay and that wordplay that jokey wordplay is something that the English language is always delighted in Mm. And probably other languages have as well, but I don't speak other languages, so I'm not very, <laughs> not as a problem, you know. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, Rebus, given, given Rebus the name Rebus, was great because in France everybody knew what a Rebus was. Um, but uh, in English, people didn't. People would say to me, you, where did you get the name come from? Mm. Well, how did you get the name? Mm. And I'd say, well, it was a, it's, a, it's a puzzle. It's a type of puzzle. Look it up in a dictionary. And it mm. is there in the dictionary, but it's not in general use in English. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Diane. Yeah. yeah, I've just got to wait another day now to do my next cryptic crossword. <laughs> Did you get withdrawal symptoms? You know what? I can't do them online. Um, I, like if I'm away and people say, oh, why don't you just download the Times? Because yeah, if, I'm, if I'm, I'm, I'm in a foreign country, I can't always get the Times. Uh, they say, oh, just download it. But I can't do it on a screen. Oh, do you, do you I need know to I need, I, need to, I need to have paper in my hand and I, I, you yeah. probably can't see this, but I've got bits where I've, I've kind of, let me see. I've kind of oh, written in one of the out. anagrams yeah, and I'm yeah. trying to work out what the anagram is. And yeah. there's, probably, there's little bits down the side where I've kind of, uh, I don't know if I've got any here. I've tried to work out what the letters might be and I've kind of put them down the side of the crossword. You can't do that on a screen, man. You've got to have paper. I'm still, a, I'm still a, as you know, I'm still a paper guy. I still like books on paper. I still buy vinyl. Um, I want to sit and read the lyric sheet and look at the, 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 the inner sleeve and all the rest of it. Um, yes. I'm an analog yes. guy in a digital world, man. Make, make an order in the world of chaos. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for that, John. That's been great fun. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for the well, I'll shall, uh, No doubt we will speak soon. Yeah. I'm well, you've got a lot of work to do now, man. You've got books to write and you've got albums that are need waiting to come out. No, you've not got an album waiting to come out? Well, I'll be 
we can't really do anything because we're stuck. We can't rehearse, but we can send files around and try and get ideas together. But it's with our kind of music, you need to play off the different musicians. Yeah. You could do other types of music though. So you can do lots of side projects. So I've been, there's a couple of poets who've been sending me poems. And I've been sent them to music. So oh, okay. Nicky Wire's brother, Patrick Jones from the man. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Tony Walsh from Manchester, he wanted me to set his, one of his poems to music. So I've been working on that. So it's, it's interesting because it's, it's different stuff and it's always good to try and do, you don't want to keep doing everything exactly the same all the time. Yeah, especially yeah, yeah. when it's not, not that big a formula for success anyway. <laughs> it's funny, I said to you at the start that I went um, I, I went to the a bar recently and it was a beer garden in Edinburgh and I was meeting up with a mate of mine, Blank Mass, um, Ben, uh, who's an electronic musician, uh, Blank Mass. Oh, and he said that he's, he's surviving by doing film soundtracks. I mean, God bless, he's, he got a, bit, a little bit of work from soundtrack, film soundtracks. Because of course he's making no money at all. He's not recording, and if he was recording, it wouldn't. You know, they wouldn't be bringing it out till next year now, probably. Um, and and he's not doing any live gigs. You know, he's, he said he's got one, and he's he's got one that hasn't been cancelled yet. That's somewhere overseas, in October, September, October, and he's just waiting for it to be cancelled. Yeah, I, like some oh, say, just, they just, just cancel 2020 and wait for 21, but yeah, don't even know in 21 really because it just we don't even know that where we are we now. It kind of it's faded a bit, but it's still there. You know, it's, it could flare up again. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, soundtrack yeah. is time to go. He's he's in a good place if he's doing that. Well, he did one recently, and I forget what the film was. I took I took the LP along again to sign it. I'm looking around here; it's in the other room. Um, but it was a film soundtrack uh, for a for a British film. Um, and it just came out very recently. I bought it not that long ago, maybe even during, I think I bought it during lockdown. I bought it online um, just to put a bit of money in his pocket. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but uh, I've not listened to it yet. I didn't tell him that I've not listened to it yet. He'll know now if he watches this. <laughs> we'll All right. <laughs> have, a, have a good day, John. Cheers, man. All right, Ian. Nice one. Thanks a lot. <laughs> See ya. See ya.